Well, good afternoon. This is the penultimate day of SciFest. Thank you for being here. Today we have a special treat. We have Dr. William Edmondson, who's um, a professor at North Carolina A&T University in the United States. In addition to being a professor there and the professor of these two young ladies here, right? Um, he has a technical background that involves having worked at uh, AT&T Bell Labs and Hughes Aircraft. He's received his master's degree from Georgia Tech and his PhD from North Carolina State. And I've got that right. He is a chair or a fellow at the NIA, a NASA fellow at the NIA, which is the National Institute of Aerospace. And he's very passionate about exploring space uh, with CubeSats and with students and using that experience as a learning experience in the classroom. So I hope that you'll give a warm SciFest welcome to Dr. William Edmondson. Thank you. Hello? Ah, got it. I turned on the mic. It always helps. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. What I hope to do is to take you on a journey, not so much a journey into space, but a journey into inner space so how you can connect what's here to what's up there. And I'm hoping that I will get you to think about, particularly the students here, to get you involved into the space community that's operating here in South Africa. So I titled this talk, Space is the Place, because I think, as many people have said, that is our last frontier. And a lot of us are explorers, either mental explorers, or actually physical explorers where you actually want to go up in space. Myself, I prefer the mental because I actually found out I'm too tall to be an astronaut. <laughs> so even if I was, wasn't afraid, I still couldn't go. Here it is. So uh, particularly from the student standpoint, where did you first learn about space? When did you first get interested in space? Anybody? I want to make this interactive, so please don't be afraid to speak up, ask questions as we go through. But also, if I ask you a question, I'd like an answer. I'm going to treat this like my class. So the students who actually speak up the most get the better grade. <laughs> Am I right, Monique? So, so getting back to the question, did you learn about space through reading comic books or just looking up at the night sky? Should I point, on, point this to you? When did you first learn about space or became first interested in space? For grade seven? Okay, what interests you, excited you about, or what did you learn in grade seven? There's no life? Okay, he says there's no life. He must have missed it. You must have missed a few talks here. <laughs> Because there actually is life in space. And in fact, something that a lot of people don't know, that there are actually little small uh, life that attaches to sometimes to uh, satellites and space junk and uh, or comets that I think it looks like, I'm trying to remember, but it actually looks like a little bitty bear. And what happens is when they're in space, they freeze, so they hibernate. And then when it gets warm, 
And so in a lot of ways, and I think it was an earlier talk, where there actually are amino acids. So there is life, I mean, in comets. So it is believed that is the start of life. Okay. So I'm going to tell you where at least I got first got interested in space. Uh, how many Trekkies are in the room? Okay, particularly for the young people, younger than what twenty. <laughs> Uh, have you heard of the TV show Star Trek? Yes. Okay, Star Trek was, I think it came out in the 70s? 67. 67, okay. That's a real trick. <laughs> and and uh, it is uh, a show where there was a people from all different types of worlds all over the universe came together to be explored. And I won't go into some of the underlying stuff that went on in Star Trek. So that, uh, there were movies. But another way you might have learned, and this is actually a good thing, sci -fest. So part of my job is getting you through my talk here, interested in space. Might not be, might be too far away. There we go. The other thing is, I grew up reading science fiction. So reading books, reading comics. And so they also got me into uh, my interest in space. Because where I'm from, I can't see the stars. There's too much light pollution. But what's nice about being in Grahamstown is that you can actually see the stars. I remember the first time I saw stars was when, uh, during a hurricane, all the power went off. And I looked up, oh, they're actually stars. Uh, I knew they were there. But uh, you might be familiar with, particularly with comic books or graphic novels. I don't know what they call them here. but. Got to make sure I get this right. Um, how many people have heard of Superman? I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Superman. You know, he came from uh, the planet Krypton. Uh, and there's uh, another one, Green, Green Lantern. Not Green Hornet, but Green Lantern, you know, which was an intergalactic, uh, what was it, an intergalactic group of superheroes to protect the universe. The other thing where I got very interested in space, I came up during a time where NASA was really saying, we're going to put a man on the moon in X amount of years. So uh, I'm a little older than what I might look. But uh, I was there during the, remember growing up five, six, eight years old, the Mercury program, the Gemini, and actually seeing folks land on the moon. So one of the dreams I had was, I want to work at NASA. So what are your dreams of space? So you see the stars up there. And again, I like some feedback from the the young ones, and any of anyone else that is younger than the age of 20. When you think of space, what do you think of? Anybody? I'll take you. When you think of space, what do you think of? You on the moon? So you want to land, you want to go to the moon. Great. Great. Anybody else wants to be go to the moon? How about Mars? Would you? Oh, so you just want to stop at the moon and let somebody else go to Mars? <laughs> Why is that? Hmm. Well, 
the moon has no oxygen. <laughs> oh, so you can get back uh, if something happens. Did you watch the movie Martian? Okay, good. Don't watch that movie. <laughs> so, now the big question is, how can you interact with space? What are the various ways that we can interact with space? So, one way is that we can just look up with telescopes and radio telescopes and observe from Earth. This is probably the safest way, and it's been done since man looked up. And there's a lot of history of thousands of years of history of man looking and exploring and finding out what, where their place is in the world, in the universe. The other way is we can actually send you up there. You know, so the astronauts, we just had one land a couple of days ago, a days ago who's been up there for a very long time. Uh, and that's exciting. They actually had, uh, NASA just, I guess they closed the application, but they were looking for astronauts. And so I actually know some folks that were older than what I thought that apply. But again, I couldn't apply because I'm too tall. <laughs> and the, the other way is actually launching an unmanned device that you can interact with and let it do the work for you. So we're talking about instead of sending you to the moon, we can send a robot. Uh, instead of sending something to the space station, we can actually send satellites to measure or observe. And so these are the three ways in which we can actually get into space. Now, we might not be able to visit uh, this nebula, but we might be able to get a better picture of it in space. So, satellites. Now that's going to be the focus of my talk. So what we're going to do is more, how do we build, design, build, launch unmanned devices to view not only the Earth, but also space itself. So an orbiting object. Uh, it could be a natural, I mean, a satellite is an orbiting object or either around a planet or around the moon. It could either be a natural, such as the moon itself, or it could be man-made, which we define as a satellite. And so orbit is that represent, or is that, or can be represented by this repeating path around some gravitational body doesn't have to really be gravitational, but it's just a, uh, a body. And note that the orbits are elliptical, and they're actually maintained by balancing velocity versus gravity. Now, how many of you, see there are two groups of students, how many of you have actually taken a string and just spun it around. And you know to get it to spin, you have to make sure that you spin it at a certain rate. Mm. Because if you don't spin it fast enough, it won't maintain the spin. Actually, if you don't spin it fast enough, it'll hit you in the head. So that same principle is actually how satellites maintain this orbit. If the orbit is not fast enough, it'll crash, crash and burn into Earth. But also, if it's too fast, that is what is called escape velocity, and it'll actually go to another location or go deeper into space. And that is actually how we send people further than Earth. So what makes up a satellite? 
what are the systems in order us to get data. And so you can think of these, these points or what actually makes up this satellite. So if I say communications, what's the communications for? Why do we need a communications model? You, uh, did you say, you tried to answer that? Okay, why do we need communication? Well, it, these are the subsystems that make up a satellite, <coughs> excuse me, that make up a satellite. So, I, in this satellite itself, There are these, one, two, three, four, five, six, these seven modules. And I need these to work. So I'm trying to get an idea of why, <coughs> why I would need a communication. If it's sending down, if it's taking data, then I need to be able to communicate with it to get that, bring that information back down. So we need a communications module. <clears throat> Command and data handling. Can anybody tell me why that one? In other words, this is my onboard computer. Yeah, so this does exactly that. It tells it what to do, how to do it. And this actually, the command and data handling is actually the brains. Guidance, navigation, and control. Some of these are really obvious. So with guidance, na guidance navigation, and control, or what uh, we say, engineers speak in acronyms. The GNC, that is actually tells us how to do the pointing whether or not it's, we're going in the right direction. And so this gives us a lot of feedback and say, okay, I'm in this orbit or I'm actually at this point in my orbit. <clears throat> but for all of this to work, what do you need? For your cell phone to work. Power. So where does the satellites get its power from, mostly. 90% of all satellites. The sun. So if you see these panels, those are solar panels. Very similar to the solar panels you might put on your house. They're just a little more efficient. Structures and thermos is just the, uh, the box that it's, all this stuff sits in. But a lot of times you also have to control the heat because it can either be too cold or too hot. And lastly, I need what is called the payload. And this is really the instrument that's going to do what we want the satellite to do. It could be visual, so you need a camera, et cetera. So here, there are many different types of satellites. So in terms of size, the space station, can you imagine that it is as big as a football field? So it's pretty large. But these things can also be very, very small. And there's actually a class I didn't put on here where there's a satellite the size of my fingernail. Um, so if you talk about space junk, to me, that's space junk. But I won't tell Mason that. <laughs> so where my work lies is in the small sets. And so this actually represents all the different classifications of what is called a small set. So these aren't football field size. These are something small. Or as what we say, it's not the size of a school bus, 
but it's actually something very small. And so you have your pico, which is about 10 centimeters. You have your nano, which is about 30 centimeters, up to micro and then to mini. So my research and my work is focused on the pico, nano, and micro. And what's confusing to a lot of people is that when you say micro or nano or pico, you're talking about 10 to the minus something. But uh, actually, it's Surrey Satellite that picked these names up, so we can blame the Brits. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of what a small sat is, this is the size of a pico. In fact, this is an actual model of a cube set that is actually circling the Earth right now. Can you guess who put up the first African cube set? Or do you know that, that uh, there is an African cube set circling Earth? Has anybody heard of that? So I'm going to actually talk about it a little bit. Um, so I'm going to give them a shameless plug. Can I do that? OK. I just had to make sure it was under eye to her. So here's a table of cube sets. This is actually a picture from uh, the Ames, NASA Ames, which uh, is kind of NASA's cube set center center of gravity, um, and this is based on the Edison, this is the Edison project. But in terms of mass, these things roughly about one to two kilograms, this is just for one U. But I can actually stack these in various combinations. So if we take a two U, these are just two stacked on top of each other, so this is kind of a unit of measurement. And I can get this up to, right now, uh, we're able to launch up to 12U, which is 3 by 4. So how do we get these things into space? Can anybody tell me? It should be an easy one. This is easy. I want to make sure I wake up the students. <laughs> and some of the uh, adults. Can you tell me what are the steps to get this through space? Fly it up, launch it, and then after you... Yeah, you throw a rocket up there. I mean, not throw a rocket, you launch a rocket up there. <laughs> And then once they get to its point, you actually throw it out. I mean, deploy it, not throw it out. So I'm going to tell you a story about it actually being thrown out. Now, I don't know if this is uh, something that's passed down that's not really a true story, but I hear it is a true story. So there's actually three ways. Uh, first is launch, usually launch on a rocket. Then it's deployed. So if this works, I might have to go on here. So this is actually a Falcon that's being launched at an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And up near the top, is where the satellites reside. And this is one way we were actually getting free rides because they were testing their rockets. And so they said, let's put a bunch of CubeSats. If it works, great. If it doesn't, there's nothing really destroyed. Uh, it was cheap. So.
So now you begin to see the island that is being launched from. I'm, this is a four minute video, but I'm not gonna play it all. So it's going through the clouds, see the condensation. And so right now, this is a two-stage rocket. And it's the first stage stopped to so get stage separation. And now you have second stage ignition. You begin to see it's getting... So it's been turned on because now you see the heat it's getting red hot. If you ever get a chance, and uh, one of the most exciting things was actually seeing a launch. Mm. I mean, you feel it, you see it, and there's really nothing greater than a night launch. And I've been to one, and I was actually five miles from the launch site, and you could still feel it, it see it go up, see all the fire. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a great experience. Uh, and so once it's up there, now we have to deploy it. And there's actually, this is actually from the space station. So this is the, what they call the nano racks. And basically it's just a, a, a mini box with springs in it. They open up the door and it just shoots out. Uh, so it's really very, very simple design. But uh, even though this is on the space station, so what we do is we send cargo up, there's a bunch of CubeSats, and then uh, they're loaded into this nano racks, and they get popped out. The other way is that these boxes, what they call pea pods, are attached to the launch vehicle or to the rocket, and when they get in position, they get popped up. So now the, the story, the fiction story, I don't know, if, again, the NASA guys should be able to help me, is that there was actually a, a Russian cosmonaut that was on the space station, and he literally, out the door, he just threw it, <laughs> threw it into orbit. And that's one picture I would like to see. <laughs> yeah. Is that a true statement? I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> At least that's the story running around the CubeSat community. So now that is something I would like to be able to do, is uh, pitch it out the door of the space station. <laughs> so why are these things important? They're important because they're inexpensive. And in fact, they're so inexpensive that high school students have actually built these and launched them. Which also means that you might think it's out of the realm of possibility, but actually it's very possible for you to get a team together design and build these things and get it launched. That should excite you. Because now you can say to all your friends, hey, I got something circling the, the globe. <laughs> and how many people can actually do that? But there's actually a lot of college, universities, that have these programs, CubeSat programs, and they're, they're able to launch them. And so there are over a hundred of these that have been launched 
in the last 15, 20 years. Yes? How long did I stay up? How long did I stay up? Good question. It actually depends on how high they are. So if they're in uh, low Earth orbit, but very low, let's say 100 to 200, 300 kilometers, uh, it could be a month to six months because you still have atmosphere and the drag will just bring it down. Now, if I'm further up, then it could be two to three years. So it actually depends upon the orbit. Now, your probably next question is, is it junk after it's finished? Is it debris? Because it's a big issue that there's a lot of junk in space and these things are small and it just becomes space junk. And so part of the community, we're trying to convince the larger community that it is not junk. And I think we actually converted one person that's in this room that I won't mention any names. <laughs> the other thing is cheaper to launch because it's small. I can actually put lots of these up in the top section of the rocket or if a bigger payload, bigger satellite has empty space, I can actually put those in that empty space. And that's why it's cheaper. Which actually, because of these two points, that means you as students can now expire, aspire to go into space. And you can do it not by becoming an astronaut, but become space engineers. So you can do it. We can even say, you know, we can get the old folks to do it as part of their uh, retirement. <laughs> the other nice thing about this, because they're so cheap, I can launch a bunch of these. And if I can get them working together, then I can actually provide a multi-satellite solution. And that's really the main focus of my research is how do I get all these talking and working together? Uh, so what can we actually use these things for? And this list is actually comes from uh, working with some of the South Africans and other African countries. What are the big issues that the developing world and Africa need in terms of satellites? One, it could provide low rate communications to the rural areas. And that actually can be a big thing and a very important thing is that now I don't have to have a doctor there. And so now we can use these as uh, telemedicine. Resource management. So in other words, what I'm talking about here is you have a lot of resources. Can we use these things to manage them such that they're not overused? Such as looking at your force, make, find tracking where the force are being cut down. Because you might be able to say, OK, there's a lot of illegal uh, cutting of trees in one particular area, and you're able to track that. Evaporation of lakes. That becomes a real big issue, particularly now, because you're in a drought. Mm -hmm. Tracking of animals, the big five. I should ask, what are the big five? See if you're awake. What's the big five? Elephants, rhinos, lions, buffalo. buffalo. We're missing one more. Leopards. So those are the big five. Uh, farmers, this could be used by farmers. You can check ocean temperature, urban planning. But another one, and we've actually, with the folks at CPUT, have looked at, in terms of disaster monitoring, the tracking of forest fires. Forest fires. 
And there you need multiple satellites because you want to be able to revisit the area at least 30 minutes. And so that would actually require about eight small sets. So has Africa launched theirs? And they have. And it's called, it used to be called Zaku, but now it's called Shapiso set. And Shapiso means promise. And this was actually, the name was chosen by a contest that they did. And it was actually launched in 2013, and it's still working. How many know what it was used for? So, where is this? We're going to do a Where is Waldo? How many people know? Who knows where this is? And this piece of property is actually owned by South Africa. Let's, let's go with the students first. Antarctica. Antarctica. It's Antarctica. And it's actually to characterize one of their super darn antennas. And actually, uh, because it's working, this is where now the US, with their super darn antennas, which are actually right next door, they actually said, if you want to use our satellite to help characterize your antenna, we can do it. So, and I think it's really the Virginia Tech guys. And I've asked them personally, do they want to? So they know it exists. So on the Shapiso set, there was actually a camera. And so when it was over this piece of land, it took a picture. Does anybody, does this look familiar? <laughs> so I, everybody's saying yes? Okay, well the students, where is this? Cape Town. So where actually is Cape Town? Is that right there? Yeah. So this is the Western Cape, a picture of the Western Cape. When I was talking about multi-satellite solutions, a lot of the satellites sort of follow this path which means that in terms of actually monitoring Africa, it's not being monitored at the same rate. And so there's a lot of gaps in the data. And so there's actually a big plan, or there's been a plan on the books and in the labs of trying to develop a constellation of sets that really look at and are concentrated on Africa. And again, this is where the students come in because they're going to need engineers to develop all these satellites. So again, it's not something that is pie in the sky, but it's something that is real that you guys, I shouldn't say guys, I should say ladies and gentlemen, could actually do. So it's real. And, uh, and this is going to happen. And this is actually called the equatorial or near equatorial orbits. So what is it that you need to become an engineer? I'm sure everybody tells you you need in SciFest, you need science, you need math. But this is again real because we describe everything using math. So you need to be like math, you need to understand math, but also you need to be interested in the science. And what I like, a lot of times people think of those as two different things, but really it's the science that kind of leads the engineers. And so I, I really love working with scientists. 
because you know I come in as an engineer and engineers think, oh, we can solve any problem. Scientists don't believe us, but give me enough time and money, I can solve anything. But the key thing is time and money. <laughs> But also, the nice thing about it, when you don't have that time, you don't have that money, you get very creative on how you solve problems. Very creative. The other nice, good thing that you as students and all need to have is be able to critically think. How do you go about solving that problem? Can you solve it in a way? And can you be innovative and creative in the solution? Because that's really where the fun begins. And so there's this statement that I use and I tell to my students, and I'm not sure if uh, one of my students remember this, but part of my job is, and what I like about it, is I like to go where no man has gone before. Do you know where that's from? Now, that side of the room, they probably know. They're old enough. It actually comes from Star Trek. And it's nice because in my class, because I have a lot of international students, they don't get half of my jokes because half of them are Star Trek jokes. So in a short amount of time, I'm going to give you my story. Actually, do you know where I am? This was actually taken in 2011. Think about it, we can answer. You can ask me doing Q&A. But what I want to say, and this is really going to the young people, is my story really starts out by growing up, fixing things, destroying things, uh, kind of a combination of both, but a lot of playing around the house, working with my father, fixing every, all the aunts and uncles, stoves, refrigerators, slot machines. So from that, everybody kept saying, oh, you must be an engineer, or you must go into engineering. And that's exactly what I did. But I didn't start in space, even though space was in the back of my head. What I wanted to do was really build Formula One cars, not drive, but build, because they are in a very advanced piece of technology. But since I couldn't go work for Ferrari, I had to settle on NASA. <laughs> Come on, Ferrari, McLaren. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in hindsight, and these are the set of skills that you need, and these actually skills will get you pretty much anywhere and be at the top of your field. And that is always learn. Be curious. Be very curious and don't be afraid to expand beyond your narrow field. The other thing is always make connections. This is why I like to work with scientists because it keeps me learning something that I have no idea, don't have the background. But the big thing is you need to go through life with no fear. No fear. And I can tell you one example was earlier this morning, I was out at Irihini. And I said, oh, can I, can I get this information? Excite the students. But I, I used my own advice. And I said, no fear. And I think I did a good job. Hopefully I did a good job with you. Any questions? So we have time for three or four questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Edmondson. Is there anybody with questions? Yes. How do satellites um, protect themselves from interference with data for other satellites? There's so much out there. And there's so many GPSs and things. Oh. So 
If I understand your correct question correctly, you want to know how do we keep everything from running into each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that picture that, that they show where the earth is about this big and all these dots, they're actually, uh, I think that's a misrepresentation. Because now if you blow that up to actual size, there's actually a lot of space in between. So uh, it is a problem. It can be a problem. But I don't know if it's that big of a problem now. But it will be. The space station, what it does is there's an organization in the US that tracks everything bigger than, I believe, a centimeter. And so it'll say, OK, and because it tracks it, it'll say, you're about to run into the space station. And the space station will actually move up or down. Now, how do they protect themselves against each other? I think that's an issue that we're trying to work out. Yeah. So I'm the mechanical the concern, daughter. yeah, she's, what she's discussing here is the interference, like RFI, between the transmissions from the various satellites. Yeah. So, oh, and there's the international oh. standards. For that. Yeah, there's the ITU, yeah. the International Tele Telecommunications Union. They actually, everybody's supposed to uh, register with them, and then they give a particular frequency. And there's special bands for space exploration. There's special dark bands so that science can actually look through that right. region. And for example, radio astronomy has a band where. Um, the nations of uh, the participants in the ITU have agreed not to transmit, so that okay. yeah. the ITU regulates that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for the okay. misunderstanding. Yeah. How does space junk affect I think it's coming to be an impact. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's and to me, I think it it sort of doesn't do what the distance is uh, just because there is a there's a huge distance. Now there are uh, rules that if you launch something, it must come down within 25 years. In terms of the CubeSat community, there's actually technology being developed. Uh, either through balloons or cells that really expand. And due to that expansion, it allows it to deorbit very quickly and it burns up. Is it monitored properly? I mean, you said within 25 years. Is that being monitored? Yes. I, oh, yes. Yes. Well, not, not on an object-by-object -object basis, but there's a radar system that keeps track of, as William has said, uh, of everything that's larger than a centimeter. And we know the trajectories of each of them, and we know what, how their orbits are decaying. And there are really complicated models for determining whether or not uh, the space is going to clear out or whether it'll be crowded. And it's really important when you're launching something. So sometimes we stand down a launch uh, because there is a possibility of some debris going overhead. When you say decaying, does it break down in space? Sometimes. Usually by things running into each other. But yeah. orbit decay, I mean, is by spiraling in. So the yeah, altitude okay, spirals in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it usually burns up in the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if this is in your field, but um, there's a lot of talk about clearing up space junk. I know you mentioned it partly, but uh, is, is there anything going ahead now to clear up space junk? There yeah, are the programs, there are programs and research being done. You know, how do we take us another satellite to capture all the, uh, sweep it up. the, yeah, kind of like a sweeper or a net that will capture all these. So there is some work being done. I mean, it is a. It's going to happen. Is it it's going to, to yeah, yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. And the other question is, um, uh, just just out of interest, how many satellites have we got orbiting the Earth currently? Well, that number I don't know. I don't no. have a clue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, somebody told me it was around <laughs> over a thousand. Lot. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Thousands. Oh, probably. Yeah. Yeah, because there's some that are dead. There are pieces yeah. of rockets that are still up there. Yeah. 
So there's, uh, yeah, there's lots of bits of... Yeah, I meant actually satellite, not rocket case. I mean, no, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. But then there are pieces, of, there's a lot of pieces of satellites yeah, yeah. that are... Uh, but, but we could safely say over a thousand, though, could we? Easily. Easily. Mm -hmm. Now, this gets into what is being probably debated over the last, is it best to send man or is it best to send machine? Uh, a lot of times the machine is cheaper and, I, and the quality of the sensing mechanisms are very high. And so in a lot of ways, do we really need to send man? But that might take all the, the fun and the fluff out of it because it's cooler uh, to send man up there. And man is adaptive. He knows, he or she knows if there's an issue or there's something that they want to look at that's a little different, they, we can adapt. And a lot, we have not yet developed the adaptability, that same level of adaptability as we are. So uh, this is a big debate. Do we really need to send man to Mars? So there's a quote by Dr. Steve Squires at Cornell, mm -hmm. who was the principal investigator of the first set of rovers that we put on Mars, Spirit and Opportunity, which lasted way longer than they were supposed to. They were designed to last 90 days, and I think Spirit died after seven years, and Opportunity is still going. It's at least 10 years old. And one of the things that he says is that if you had put a human geologist on the surface of Mars, all of the science that was done by those two rovers over that many years could have done, been done by a human being in a week. Mm -hmm. you know, and the, now, but Dr. Edmondson points out it's much more expensive to send a human being to Mars than it is a pair of rovers. Yeah. So there's that trade-off that people have to make. And since I can't get into space because I'm too tall, I'm on the, uh, machines, right? yeah, I need better machines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should we be worried about uh, carbon emissions uh, resulting from uh, uh, burning the fuel, rocket fuel into space? Now that I'm going to defer because it's hydrogen and oxygen. Carbon emissions from the launches. Yeah. No. I'll just say no. <laughs> <laughs> what about the uh, punching the, the hole uh, in the ozone layer? But, so the space shuttle uh, propellants were, were not carbon-based. Um, they were hydrogen and oxygen and then uh, solid propellants, which were uh, alumina-based. But, uh, but the Delta II fleet used kerosene and liquid oxygen as its principal propellants. But the amount of it that it uses compared to the the um, uh, uh, burning of fossil fuels during the course of even a single day within the United States is tiny, tiny. So, imperceptible. So if you couldn't hitch a free ride with your little cube satellite, how much would it on average cost to, to actually yeah, get a paid ride up, up there in, into space? Um, and I think the cost is going down, but I know maybe four or five years ago, and Jim to clarify, I think it's like 40K, 40, 40K per kilogram. It depends on who your carrier is. Yeah. Some of them charge exorbitantly more, and some of them give the space away because they've got to carry ballast or something. Right. So okay. it's really, uh, it's an open field at the moment, right? And there's, yeah. um, there are actually groups that get together and sort of match make CubeSats to open space on satellites, because not all CubeSats want to go to the to all of the different orbits. Yeah, so it's a vibrant. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Okay. See, that's a whole communications networking issue. 
Um, and really it depends on the, what we call the telephone company. So depending on where it is, you can either, if it's like inter, intercontinental, it actually might get to whatever the local node is, send it up, and then send it back down. Or it'll send it through fiber across the ocean. So you may never know. So, how right. Your message yeah. Is delivered. Yeah. So there's some big fancy algorithm that says, oh, we'll go this way and down. We'll go under the ocean with the fiber. Uh, or we'll just do microwave all the way from one point to the next. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Edmondson. And thank you. Thank you.